This is David Thompson of Assemblage Plus in Los Angeles, and you're listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw mine modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. I'm Tom Guild. The American Institute of Architects, or AIA, is the leading professional association for architects in the United States. And U.S. Modernist Radio was there for their national conference last June in Chicago. The AIA has about 94,000 members, and this was the first in-person conference the National Association has had since COVID. People were thrilled to be anywhere, especially back at that conference, and even former President Obama showed up to speak. We've heard for years he wanted to be an architect at one point, but strangely, he's not returning our phone calls to talk about it. Seriously? No. What's up with that? Our George Smart spoke at the conference, too, to many, many fewer people than President Obama. But on the plus side, he found some great people to interview, not including Obama. Today, you'll hear George's conversations with Katie Swinson of Mass Design Group, known for emotionally powerful buildings like the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, a.k.a. the National Lynching Memorial in Montgomery, Alabama. After that, George visits with Kira Gould, a communication strategist, author, and co-host of the podcast, Design the Future, who was awarded an honorary AIA status at the conference. But wait, there's more. We'll have musical guest Michael Sinatra singing the standards most modernists know and love. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Diane Bald and the Budman family, restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs, and by modernist realtor Angela Roll. In a classic tale that we are largely making up, modernist realtor Angela Roll worked her way through college, dancing like no one's watching to mumble number five and brilliantly house-flipping Neutra houses, sometimes simultaneously. At 22, following a celebrity-filled party at a famous hillside modernist house in L.A. involving late-night swimming, fig-infused goat cheese, absolute lime, and a new use for WD-40, Angela was recruited to architecture school. There, she spent years in sleep-deprived design studios. Now, she's a modernist real estate agent with specialized design training, advising buyers and sellers on everything, from appropriate renovation to staging a martini party for 200 people from 2,800 miles away. That last sentence is 100% true. Reach her at AngelaRoll.com. That's R-O-E-H-L or 919-995-0550. Katie Swinson earned a B.A. in Literature from Berkeley and a Master's from the UVA School of Architecture. Now a senior principal at Mass Design Group in Boston, one of the most important public design firms in the world, Katie has become a prominent voice in conversations on how design can affect health, social justice, and stronger communities. In 2019, Harvard named Swinson a Loeb Fellow, recognizing her contributions to design activism. In 2020, KD published two books, In Bohemia, a memoir of love, loss, and kindness, and Design with Love, At Home in America. In 2021, she won the AIA Award for Excellence in Public Architecture. Here's George's conversation with Katie Swenson. The typical story of an architecture firm is when it used to be a guy, now it's men and women, go to school, and get inspired by some other architect and then go out and start designing hospitals and schools and things like that. And they have a firm, and they have things that firms have, like an HR person and a rent payment and sales and marketing to do. And the firm kind of evolves around a person, generally. Uh, Maybe the firm is named after the person or XYZ and partners. But my guest today is with a firm that has a, a different business model for that. And in addition, it's, it's not exactly a firm. It's a nonprofit is how it's organized. Because I checked. I look up. It's 990 on ProPublica. So welcome. Thanks for coming in. 
So glad to be here. Thanks for having us. The story of Mass Design Group is one where your two founders, Alan and Michael, started this in 2010 and have since then become really one of the world's leaders in, I don't know what you call exactly, public service architecture? Is that a general That's a great term for it, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Doing projects around the world, including the U.S., inspiring legions of architecture students to want to follow in the path and, and work with you and really bringing a lot of love mm. to this, mm. which is something you know about because mm. you've written on love. <laughs> I love to write about love. <laughs> Tell me about your books. Yeah, so, I mean, no better place to start a conversation today than around love. I think everything that's happening in the world right now is sort of about division and We heard from President Obama at the AIA conference about the division in the country. And, you know, in so many ways, I guess I always come back to love somehow being the answer. You know, as well as I do, that there are so many different kinds of love. The Greeks talk about eight different kinds of love. We know romantic love. I've written about that in my book, In Bohemia. I write about the power of romantic love. I write about the love of two women who were born in the 1850s, love partners, Kathleen Lee Bates, who wrote America the Beautiful, and her partner of 25 years, Catherine Komen, both authors and scholars who were having a relationship in uncharted territory and building a house that could exemplify their relationship that I was so lucky to by and move into 100 years after they Oh, so built it. this is your house now. This is my house now. It's called the Scarab. And I experienced great love and also great loss in that house. And I write in In Bohemia, a memoir of love, loss, and kindness about my love and grief story with my beautiful partner, Tommy Niles, who died very suddenly of a heart attack, and how much I learned from... Catherine Komen and Catherine Lee Bates in their relationship and the way that Bates grieved Komen in the volume of this very special house and a very special room in it called Bohemia. So I've written about romantic love and the power of a sort of transformational love. I think what I learned most from them and really from Tommy is how maybe the best thing we can do is shine the light on each other and lift each other up. And I write about that in my book, Design with Love, At Home in America, which tells stories from the Enterprise Rose Architectural Fellowship. Mm -hmm. I was a fellow. And then I was so lucky to direct that program over many years. I got to work with probably 80 or 90 fellows over those years in communities around the country. And in Design with Love, I try to lift up the stories of 10 of those communities, the community activists who are working, what are the issues that are important to them, and then introduce an architectural fellow into the equation who's bringing a value system to support communities through design and tell those stories in Design with Love. So I've been really interested in the idea of the power of individuals to dig deep into what is most important to them and then how they and we come together with each other to set a higher ambition and mission. And I think that's what Mass is trying to do, to work with community partners of all shapes and sizes in all sorts of places to help them really identify their deepest mission for their organization or their collaboration, and then understand how architecture and design can help support their ability to meet their mission in their communities. A central premise of your firm appears to be healing, Mm. usually from some horrible thing. It could be the Rwandan genocide. It could be 400 years of racial oppression, slavery, marginalization, incarceration, that your firm is trying to take architecture as a healing process. Is that accurate? 
Yeah, I mean, it's hard to be a human, isn't it? I think that... What were my choices? Yeah, <laughs> it's hard to be a human. I think that when we understand sort of the injustices that as humans we bring against each other, as we also understand the inevitable realities of life and death and the sort of uncertainty of our time and moment here on earth, I think it's, we're probably always in the process of some kind of healing and maybe even in some kind of hurting, you know, mm -hmm. we're in this kind of cycle, I would say. When Mass got started, as you referenced, with Michael Murphy and Alan Ricks and Dave Saladek and Christian Benimana and Sierra Bainbridge and many other young people working in partnership with Paul Farmer from Partners in Health and Dr. Agnes Benaguahu, a pediatrician who had returned after the genocide in Rwanda against the Tutsis to rebuild the health infrastructure of the country, these young architects and designers were learning from people who were deeply invested in the long-term health and well-being of individuals and communities. And Paul Farmer had a kind of conception that underpinned his work that he called a preferential option for the poor. And in his terminology, the poor deserve the very best, the best in healthcare, the best in architecture, the best in design. At the AIA conference in Chicago in June of 2022, we heard President Obama talk about that in terms of affordable housing. Mm -hmm. He actually said almost those same words, which is that the people in our society who are in most need of housing that's affordable also need the highest quality and best designed housing and larger communities. So I think that's a form of love. I think that when we love, we seek to create the best conditions for the people around us, for the people that we love. We right. seek to create a kind of platform whether it's for our children to succeed or our families to succeed. Love is sort of a conceptual framework that says, I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to shine the light on you. I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to create the conditions for your highest sense of identity and your health and well-being. And that's what was happening on this incredible area in northern Rwanda incredibly beautiful, beautiful place. Rwanda is simply one of the most sort of geographically stunning places I've ever been in my life and a warm and welcoming and beautiful people who had experienced, of course, one of the worst human tragedies in our lifetimes. 800,000 people or so, roughly? Uh, they say even closer to a million okay. over 100 days. And you know, we're now 28 years, and it's a community through their processes, including what they call kobuka, which means to remember, who every year kind of dig deep as a society to remember and understand what happened and understand how to move forward. But in that context, I think we see Rwanda in some way leapfrogging us in many ways. They've taken on policies and investments in their community that move sort of far beyond where some of us are in, in some of our policies worldwide. So in this rural community where at the time in 2008, 9, and 10, when the building project was getting started, there were over 400,000 people without access to medical services of any kind. But in building this hospital called the Butaro District Hospital, the goal of the project was to bring the very best in every way. And so we learned so much. We learned how to design for infection control, which has become incredibly important to yes. all of us. The idea that a building, um, a hospital is not a building where medical services happen, but that the building itself should participate in the healing of the patients and also the healing of a community. 
So 4,000 people were employed locally in the construction of this project. It was really built very much kind of by hand. How large is this hospital in terms of number of beds? It's 120 beds. Okay. And it's being expanded all the time. So it started with the hospital and then it went to building housing for doctors to work in the hospital so that people, they could recruit people from around the world to come and practice there. Then we built the first and still only rural oncology center in the region. And then, of course, in Rwanda, people, when they go to the hospital, they bring their families with them for support. So we built housing for families to live in while they were there. Their, their loved one was receiving chemotherapy and had to stay on premise for a certain amount of like time. Like a Ronald McDonald house. Like a Ronald McDonald yeah. house, yeah. Yeah, so the campus has expanded and Paul Farmer and Dr. Agnes Minowahu went on to build a new University of Global Health Equity, of which she is now the chairperson and a place that he was deeply attached to. A number of years ago, there was a group that got big fanfare called Architecture for Humanity. Oh, sure, yeah. That uh, collapsed mm. into a sort of a big heap. Mm -hmm. And when I look at their mission and look at yours, they're very similar, but you guys have done it. In fact, when I ask people about Mass Design Group around here, they go, oh yeah, they're the real thing. Oh, they're the real deal. Yeah, well, it's great to hear. You know, for me, I entered the profession of architecture really after getting my master's in architecture from the University of Virginia in 2000. In 2001, I was in the second class of a program called the Enterprise Rose Architectural Fellowship. Mm -hmm. The Rose Fellowship was founded in the year 2000. Architecture for Humanity was founded, I believe, in about the year 2000. Yeah. Design Corps and their annual conference, Structures for Inclusion, was right. founded Brian around Bell. that yep. time. And Public Architecture was founded also around that time. So community design has been around probably forever. And certainly the Association for Community Design dates back to the 70s with early practitioners kind of responding to the calls in the 60s for community-engaged design that we all know the Whitney Young kind of quote in the start of, I would say, that movement. But there was a lot of fresh energy that started around the year 2000. And I've had the privilege of working with people around the country. We were at some point maybe a small but mighty group of people working in community design centers, trying to kind of duke it out and learn from each other. And we'd come together through the Association for Community Design and through an annual conference, Structures for Inclusion, that Design Corps used to facilitate. It was a real gathering. I would say in the early 2000s, there were, I don't know, 150 people there maybe every mm -hmm. year. Yes. By 2010, Howard University at Structures for Inclusion, I think there were about 450 people. And I was there with a group of Rose Fellows. It was a big day for me. I met my colleague now, Joseph Kunkel, who we later recruited to be a Rose Fellow, and now he runs the Sustainable Native Communities I know Joe very well yeah. because he helped our website with some photos of a house that had been destroyed way oh, back. Oh, wow. I just Wonderful. met him the other night. Oh, fantastic. I also that day listened to Michael Murphy present on the Bitaro District Hospital and um, I remember sitting there in the audience thinking that there had been a like seismic shift in our field. For those of us who'd been working in that field for 10 years, my group was working in housing, so we were working at scale. We were trying to inflect a system, system of housing. Yes. And I, I think we did that in many, many ways. But when mass design came and they were working at the scale of a hospital, it felt like there was a seismic shift happening in the field. And I stood in line with Michael at lunch that day and we sat down and started talking. And I became a friend, fan, collaborator. Later, we moved our offices in together. I joined the board did a lot of connecting and fundraising for them and became a champion for mass design from that day because 
I believed that that group of young people were really forging new territory and making a kind of model that I think has really borne out with Alan Ricks's kind of ability to invest in what makes people passionate about an issue and mm -hmm. kind of say, well, what do you want to do and where do you want to go? We've been able to create a kind of a larger infrastructure of the company that supports a very like ambitious entrepreneurial kind of energy where people gather behind a set of values and a set of core concerns and issues. But those issues are very broad now. You know, right. we, we started in hospitals. We could have built hospitals. That was never the idea, was to build one hospital and then build a thousand. The idea from the beginning was always to take on really hard issues and see how we could demonstrate a sort of new approach to that issue that would help that industry think bigger. Right. So how do you, or do you, translate these loving healing processes into some form of justice? Because historically, because I've read all the magazines back for decades, architecture has this sense that it can solve social problems, that it can actually bring about this change, but it kind of stops short of really participating in the political scene or in the scene of getting the political will to get something done. Is that the next frontier for architecture? Well, I think that, you know, the architecture is a, I mean, it's, a, it's so many things, right? One part of it is a, it's a means, it's a method. Design is always a kind of methodology. Mm -hmm. So I would say the first thing that defines so much of our work is understanding who are the trailblazing organizations and leaders who are on the front lines of the most important justice issues? And how do we put wind in their sails and help them solve these issues around justice? So, so you're like a fellowship. We are, well, maybe we are like a fellowship. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that Patricia Gritz has done so much research. She is a senior principal in our Boston office. She's been with Mass nine years. And she and Regina Chen and others have built out what we call it, the purpose-built work. And Patricia, I heard her recently, and I, I don't have all the exact numbers, but I heard her quote a study of nonprofits in, that was done out of Chicago, actually, that asked nonprofits to what extent they understood their buildings as assets to amplify their mission. Mm -hmm. And the majority of them did not see their buildings or their built infrastructure as an asset to pursue their mission. So I think that's one of the core principles of our purpose-built methodology and the way that we understand our engagement. You know, our built environment makes up so much of our lives. We spend our lives inside so much and we know the amount that buildings contribute to our larger environmental crisis and everything. But we try to help nonprofits leverage design process the manifestation of architecture and their built environments to help them leverage that in pursuit of their larger justice missions. Right, right. You're a means to that end. We're a means to that end. But meanwhile, we're a means to many ends, right? They're a means to what's, what's inherent in the construction process. What are the materials that you're choosing? Who's making it? What and are the And you help hands? raise money for some of these organizations, we too. We sure do, yeah. We provide organizations with the kind of materials and vision that they have in their minds, but not always on paper, to be able to recruit supporters. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, architecture is a long game. And I heard Dan Hart, the president of the AIA, talk about the first, second, and third lives of architecture. The first life is when it opens. The second life is like, does it respond over the next, let's say, 25 years to the uses that it was maybe intended for? 
And then the third horizon, he says, is will it last 100 years and how will it evolve over time? So architecture is both the means for sure, but it's also has to contribute for the long term. And I think the idea... Or someone has to care, at least. Yeah, I think when, you know, one of the things that we learned from Paul was that Paul Farmer in Butaro, we expected that the metrics of success of the hospital would be, you know, the quality of care for the patients, their health outcomes. And certainly those things have been very positive. Also, maybe doctor recruitment and nurse satisfaction and staff support for the project. But one of the things we learned there was that beauty is a form of justice, that actually the beauty of the architecture is part of what contributes to a sense of justice and that that lasts over the long term. Because certain populations got the ugly buildings. For sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Congratulations to your firm on your Firm of the Year Award this year. This has been quite a week for you guys. It sure has. Thank you. Katie, thanks for talking with me. Okay. Thank you very much. That was George with Katie Swenson of Mass Design Group. Communications expert Kira Gould has been working to promote architecture, design, and sustainability for decades. With a BA in Journalism and English and a Master's in Architecture and Design Criticism, she has shaped communication strategy for leading firms in design, construction, and development, helping practitioners to maximize their stories. Her latest storytelling is the podcast Women in Sustainability, Design the Future, which she co-hosts with Lindsay Baker. It has a focus on climate change and the impact women are making in the design field today. It's always fun to chat with another architecture podcast host. So here we go with Kira Gould. So, Lawrence, Kansas, huh? Indeed. The heartland. And you were vice president of the Key Club. I was. My researchers dug up. Yes, the vice president of the Key Club. And I guess once in Key Club, always in Key Club because... Your service to the profession now, right? (laughs) This is all about service. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, Your podcast has been going on how long now? We started it in um, March of 2020, so right before the pandemic. Yeah, and 60-some episodes? That's right. We just recently recorded our 68th. So do you do most of them... By remote, like through Zoom or something like that? They are all, they've all been through Zoom. We actually started working that way even before the pandemic, interestingly. And then, of course, it hit. And so it was convenient that we didn't have to rejigger. And it it turned out to be just an amazing way for Lindsay and I to maintain connection with one another and meet amazing people. It turned into a little bit more of a lifeline during the pandemic than I had originally anticipated it would be as a project. There's this really great Danish TV series that just got renewed on Netflix called Borgen. I don't know oh, if you've ever yeah, seen it. I have. And they did three seasons 10 years ago, and now they're doing the fourth season. It, it's amazing. And one of the little themes through Borgen, because it's about female prime minister mm-hmm. of Denmark, yep. is that the future is female, right? Right. And your show is all about women in architecture. It is. We do focus on women. It's called Design the Future. And so we primarily feature women who are working in the built environment in some way related to sustainability and resilience and and those areas. And I don't know, I, I've never really liked the future as female as a term because it seems sort of exclusionary, which is sort of the opposite of what I think the the kind of female leadership model is, which is more inclusionary. But I, I mean, I guess it's catchy. Future. Yeah. It, oh, yeah. It's great. <laughs> and it seems to me that at least in architecture and nonprofits and certainly here in the AIA itself, the future is female. I mean, all the leaders are women now. We are seeing more and more of it. It's great to see. I have to say, since working on a book about women in sustainable design, um, that book came out 15 years ago. So I, I, I think we have seen more and more of that. In some ways, though, it was sort of 
we, we saw a precursor of it in sustainability, and now it's sort of spreading through mainstream design. And so I'm, I'm delighted to see that. I think it's a perfect example of the value of diversity because we need not just people who are different, but also different styles of leadership and different approaches to projects and to organizational management and all those things. So you have worked for a firm before, William McDonough, right? That's right. Which he seems to be one of those kind of under the radar Merlin types, you know? <laughs> oh, I'm not sure he would like to be described as under the radar. <laughs> but not as big as others, right? I mean, just sure, kind, of a, sure. kind of a niche, the it's architect's a, architect. Perhaps, yes. Yeah. And I, yes, I think with also a very um, specific kind of vision, you know, when he did the Tower of Tomorrow that was in Fortune magazine in 2006, it seemed like a very science fiction-y thing to talk about at that time. But of course... Now a lot of firms are really looking at what regenerative architecture can be. So that's very funny. I, it's a funny way to describe him. But yes, it was a great, it was a wonderful group of people with that firm. And, and he's an amazing, well, I mean, his book with Michael Braungart, Cradle to Cradle, was a huge influence on my thinking very early on. So it was a, a real pleasure and, and an honor to work with that, with that firm. So now you have clients in your firm that you work with. So yep. what do you do for them? So Kira Gould Connect is a communications consultancy, which is a really broad term that can include really anything. Really um, anything. Intentionally yeah. so. <laughs> um, most of my clients are architects, and I do a variety of things for them. Some of them really want visibility. So I help them get attention from the media, help them package their work in a way that will be appealing and, and tells a story, not just says, hey, here, it's a completed project. <laughs> Uh, so that's sort of the baseline stuff. But what I really enjoy is the much more strategic thinking about how communications can really advance their message and how it can also drive their firm, how their firm is organized, how they cultivate talent, and how they do their work, how they engage with communities, and how they're really bringing all those things into the work, um, including how they communicate with clients about value and design excellence and what design excellence and value really include on the sustainability and resilience and equity front. Can you get them to return people's phone calls in a timely way? Can you do that, Kira? My clients? Yeah. <laughs> that is beyond my scope. I'm sorry to say. You have to be Merlin to do that. There you go. There you go. Because, you know, I noticed that when I've contacted a number of firms, either as a potential client or as a media or something like that, that, you know, it just lands there and you, you never hear back. Interesting. And yet the the firms that are like right on it, yep. that I get a call back the same day from somebody, even if they're saying no, sure. it's really great, is, it really raises my whole impression of the organization of the firm. I mean, if they can return a call in a day, think what they could do with my hospital or school sure. or a house or anything like that. Well, George, that does kind of seem like 101. So I would hope that my clients are performing. Trust me, it's not my 101 gosh, for that's everybody. Just terrible. <laughs> <laughs> we might have a little more work to do here than I thought. Um, yeah, no, I completely agree. That's kind of a baseline. Mm -hmm. Really need to be responsive, even if it's a no. And that's actually another thing I talk to my clients all the time about. I, I really counsel them to actually make no-go decisions on work much more frequently, and recommend others. I mean, yeah. there's, you don't have to do every job just because it comes knocking. You have to really cultivate the clients that are the best fit. And sometimes a client wants things and you're not really the right one to do it, but you can help them find someone else and then you've left them with a good impression and you can be right. keep the room for the other work. You know, if the CIA needs a rendition facility in Guatemala, <laughs> okay, you might want to okay. pass on that too. Yes, indeed. I think that... <laughs> In the Department of Extreme Examples. Yes. That's our department. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about sustainability. Okay. I'm just a mere mortal. I'm not an architect. I didn't go to architecture Actually, school. Actually, you're an honorary architect. Well, yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute. But it seemed like that sustainability started out as energy efficiency, that that was sort of the general genre people discussed it 20, 30 years ago. Like, we got this building... And how do we make it more energy efficient? Because it's going to save us all this money. And by the way, mm -hmm. it's going to have these other side effects. It's going to help the climate. It's going to reduce consumption. It's going to blah, blah, blah. Yep. And, and now we've shifted that sustainability means a lot of different things. Yep. Pre-construction, during construction, 
post-construction where it was all before. It was always after the building was built. Yeah. That's when you get your sustainability in place. And now there's there's movements even to look at, you know, where does this stuff come from? Oh, yes. Is this coming from some despotic state in Asia yes, that absolutely. is imprisoning people to ship these things to our Walmart, you know, somewhere? I mean, right. where is it all going lately? Well, so I think actually that it, it was holistic to begin with, and it got narrowed probably in the 80s and 90s in order to try to make a market transformation. It, it got narrowed to energy efficiency, and, and we are still recovering from that narrowing, frankly, um, because it's been very hard. In narrowing it, we also siloed it from design, and that was the, the biggest mistake in many ways because it's extremely hard to get it unsiloed now. And it's seen by many people, particularly capital A architects concerned with design as a separate thing from design. And in my mind, it's absolutely integrated. And it makes it much easier to have the conversation about it if you see it as all one thing. And so it does include equity and it does include material sourcing and equity issues related to that. And certainly includes carbon now is the big hot area, but it also includes all the issues of sight and what we're doing and how and how we're relating to how energy sources relate to community health. I mean, it's very broad. I mean, maybe that's why we had to silo it so narrowly to get people to address it. I think that before that period, it was a more, even broadly speaking, we understood it more as having working towards regeneration and systems thinking and a whole look at everything. And then it got narrowed, and now we're finally widening it back up again. It's a little painful to watch, <laughs> frankly. Architects, with the ones with a big A, it seemed like they would be leading this kind of thing and not necessarily resisting it. It would seem like it would be their clients that would resist it more because they're paying for it. Yes, and many are. There are a number of amazing designers, big A architects and others, yeah. um, who are leading in this area. The current gold medal winners, Angie Brooks and Larry Scarpa, are a good example. Um, and Mass Design Group, Mass another Design, recent absolutely, winner. and many others. I do think, though, overall as a whole, the profession has resisted leading on this for reasons that have perplexed me for my, pretty much my entire career, um, and instead have been sort of falling back on this idea because it's a client service profession that it's acceptable to say things like, well, my clients aren't asking for that, so I'm not going to do that. Which of course is ridiculous because your clients want value. That is straight up. All clients want value. They may define that differently, but that's what they want. And I don't see those same architects ever making that excuse about why they wouldn't provide design excellence to those clients. Well, is this a matter of hiding the peanut butter in the medicine kind of thing? I mean... <laughs> well, to a certain extent, yes. <laughs> um, when I was working with my father's firm, Gould Evans, many years ago, that firm is now called Multi-Studio, we, we referred to it then, and it was a, that firm was based in, is based in Kansas City, and they had, at that point, we were doing green design in the Midwest with clients that were, they didn't see an energy crisis anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so we, we used to even call it like stealth green, yeah. right? You would yeah. just build it into the project. They want value, we're going to build it in, which would include doing things like making something PV ready, right? Like, so you may not be able to afford the panels now. Set up your roof so that when you can, That's you can photovoltaic, them. folks, for those of you that are following Thank along. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies, <laughs> acronyms, jargon. I, I slipped. I'll translate as we go. I appreciate it. <laughs> You say you've been perplexed for a long time about why the profession, the AIA, has not been more behind this. It seems like in talking with various people here at the conference, everybody has a set of expectations about what AIA should do. <laughs> kind of like we all think the president can wave a magic wand and, and do something. So given that you're very knowledgeable about all this, what do you think that, that the AIA should be doing and where should they be stepping forward to move this ahead? Well, I think actually the AIA has stepped forward on sustainability in recent years in many ways. It's really embedded in the strategic plan that is the operating manual right now. That's been positive. It's been yeah. very good. I think as a profession, it's moving too slowly. 
Frankly, okay. it's, I mean, to be quite frank, it's moving far too slowly for the emissions drawdown that we, that we absolutely have to have. And so the built environment community is responsible for a significant portion of emissions, and we're just not drawing it down fast enough at all. We have to address reuse, and we have to address new buildings, and we have to do it much more aggressively. So it's not, I'm not trying to lay it all at the feet of the AIA, and I'm happy that they have made progress in recent years. Thrilled about that and thrilled and honored to be sort of a part of some of that through my work with the Committee on the Environment. But I do think that the profession is not quite accepting how big a move it's going to take and how fast it needs to go. Okay, another question might be, how hot does it have to get before we do something? I mean, with these temperatures. that's an excellent question. Yes, when I landed in Chicago on Tuesday night at 1045 and it was 90 degrees, you know... (laughs) hot, apparently. Um, but I mean, that's like anything. It's like the melting of the glaciers and other things. The, the, the number of signals that we all, the, those of us who were talking about this in the 90s, I just am betraying my age here, <laughs> but I can live with that. You're so youthful. And oh. yes. <laughs> but there are certain things that we thought, well, if this were to happen, then surely things would move more quickly. And we've passed all of those thresholds, yeah. you know. So I don't know what the answer is to that. I think the awareness is growing, and certainly uh, young people are putting pressure on a variety of institutions and governments, and that's good to see from my perspective. Sure, (laughs) Um, sure. So, you know, movement is happening. I still think it's too slow, Yeah. Um, but it's good. Progress is being made, but it, it really does need to pick up. Do any benchmarks come to mind, either states, countries, things like that. I mean, organizations that are really doing this well for a large area of property. Well, I do think that the cities and communities of all scales have somewhere in the last five to 10 years decided that they didn't need to wait for federal leadership on certain things. And so they are really making strides around decarbonization and really aggressively looking at incentives for retrofits because reuse is going to have to take a much larger role in the profession going forward. I know it's not the sexiest thing. Those capital A architects do not love reuse projects, but some of them are doing some of the most amazing design work, which is actually renovation based. And so those are the shifts. There's like a cultural shift that has to happen there. But cities, cities are doing things. Some companies are really trying to do things in an aggressive way that address um, not only their operations and embodied carbon situations, but also supply chain, what their influences along the supply chain. And that's mm-hmm. really a big shift. And that's what we have to get to. It's just scale. We have to scale this up. So I, I still want to ask, can you think of any places that are doing that well specifically? Um, like, who do we look towards to lead the way for us going ahead? That's an interesting question. I'm trying to think of some good examples. I mean, is it Lawrence, Kansas, for instance? I mean, tell me someplace. <laughs> um, well, Lawrence, Lawrence actually and Douglas County have made some strides. I do think that's what you're seeing. You're seeing certain communities with really plucky sustainability manager folks, many of whom are young just deciding to go for it, you know, and they'll see what they can get passed across city council. And then you're seeing decarbonization happening in terms of local zoning and a lot of cities and towns getting rid of natural gas, for example. It's going to be, I mean, they're chipping away at it. So in terms of like the big examples, I mean, that's sort of the problem with this situation. You have to start just, I mean, regulations are hurting a lot of the things and that's been giving clients and architects a pass, right? Well, well, the code doesn't require it, you know, okay, so we'll just keep specking fossil fuels. Well, we can't. And in fact, for clients, that's going to cost them more because they're going to have to retrofit out of that in five or 10 years if they don't do it now. So I guess it's a very dispersed answer to your question, but I think the real heroes are the people that are passing local and state ordinances about building performance standards and different fuel sources, because those are that's starting to change the mindset and change the culture. Have you heard anything about New Zealand? Because they seem to be the country that does almost everything well. They've got a female prime minister. Yes. They're very climate conscious. Yep. Are they doing anything down there that we can learn from? They are. They absolutely are. 
I don't have a lot of specifics on what's going in, on in New Zealand, but they, uh, there absolutely is some very interesting and very holistic look at this stuff there. Um, the other great thing about New Zealand and actually Australia as well is that they've been really looking at interesting ways of bringing in indigenous knowledge to what they're doing around sustainable design, which is extremely important and something we certainly need to be doing better here around all kinds of things, not least of which is fire management. Fire management? Yes. What is fire management? Well, addressing how we, of course, have developed our way into a very dangerous situation with fires. We are letting developed areas encroach natural areas, and then we're not, we don't do sort of controlled burns anymore because that's, it's unsafe to be doing that so close to developed areas. And we really need to take a step back and look more holistically at what can control that going forward as things warm up, because okay. there's a lot of, there's, there's great risk right now to a lot of areas, and we are not, um, well, some states and some communities have tried to adjust their zoning t- to address this, but it's very slow. And in the meantime, population growth and other things is just is fueling the development that is putting many communities in, in harm's way, frankly. We're seeing more of those fires all the time. This sounds like playing SimCity, which I did, <laughs> you know, 25 years ago. Sure. And you could turn on the disaster mode. Oh, yeah. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> and the fires would start. And if you didn't have enough fire departments, yep. you know, your, your no, buildings right. would burn, Right. I think we're in that, and and somebody turned on disaster mode, and now we're trying to, like, real-time design our way out of it. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I notice here in the Hyatt, looking down on McCormick Place, which, Mm -hmm. if you don't know, is a gigantic convention center multi-building, I didn't see a single solar panel on the roof. Not one. That's interesting. I don't know. I did hear in a session yesterday that there are some interesting aspects to this project, too. That are, it, they called it a trigen facility, and I don't know all the details of how that operates here or even what that specifically is. Does that is. mean there are three guys in the basement generating something? Maybe. <laughs> um, but I do think there are some interesting things going on in here. I don't know why they don't have solar panels. Yeah. I'm not sure about that. Because the roof is just very plain. It's got little tiny skylights in yeah. most of the buildings. One building has this monster-sized fan unit up there. Uh-huh. But everything else is kind of flat, and I'm looking out on this and going, like, this is the perfect place yep. for acres and acres of solar panels right. and battery backups and things like that. That's right. That's right. And at least to have something. Tell me about the role of water in the future. Uh, water. Water is a tricky one. Um, that's another area where a cultural change is needed. We need to start thinking about it more clearly. And I don't necessarily think that means just staying with a scarcity mindset about it. What it really means is like like right now in California where I live, we're in a drought, a very long-term drought, and there's a lot of pressure on homeowners to dial their use down, which is important, but it seems to homeowners there, it seems odd because, of course, agricultural uses in the state for both staple crops and many others are the huge water hog, right? So it seems to me that we're not having appropriately balanced conversations about those things. Like, I'm not sure, this will incite frustration from the almond lobby, (laughs) but like, I don't know if we will afford, going into the future, will we be able to afford the volume of almond farming that we do in California. Maybe not, because almonds are not, you know, that's not a staple crop. It's, I I don't know. I mean, those are the conversations we need to have. I know, Kira, that sometimes (laughs) you feel like a nut and sometimes you don't. You had to go there. Then I, 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 I should have seen that coming. I don't, I don't know you that well, but I, I feel like I could have predicted that. <laughs> Those are the kinds of bigger conversations that we need to have. And, of course, that would affect almond farmers, and we would have to address that. But I do think we're going to have to look. There are going to be a number of hard decisions happening in the future that relate to resources. It would be great if we could start having those kinds of rational conversations right now, rather than being sternly reprimanded by our governor on a daily basis about how many times we're flushing the toilet. Like, I just, I, I feel like it's like a lot of things in culture today. There's like an imbalance about what we're talking about. And all those things are important. And I absolutely think that residential use needs to be curtailed for sure. But it's 
in the context of what? Right. And in proportion, like understanding the proportions of that. Because I think right now the entire state of California is being guilted into thinking that the drought is their fault, right? And residential water use is not actually what is... I'm sure Elon Musk is at the bottom of it somewhere. He's being blamed for everything lately. I'm not going to blame it on (laughs) Elon Musk. He's got plenty of other fish to fry right now. I'm I'm sure he's not out there worrying about this, but I I wouldn't mind if he did turn his mind toward it for a minute. That would be great. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) You know, one of the things that amazes me is that in a number of jurisdictions, including my own, if you want to do something positive, like recycle rainwater, the city wants to charge you for this, to use your own rainwater in the system. That's just crazy. That is crazy. I think you're in North Carolina. Yeah. That is exactly why the tedious work of local codes is so important, because those kinds of things are driving so many things. And so then you get a willing homeowner who's like, hey, I think I should do this. And, you know, their six-year-old has come home saying, we should recycle our water, and they want to do this project, and they run into that. That's a perfect example of why that stuff. Nobody wants to do local codes. It's very, it's, it's tedious work. Yeah. Uh, it's so important. It drives so many things, including even perceptions. So the homeowner who walks away from bumping into that barrier has a terrible perception about his or her role in environmental stewardship. Exactly. They, it's terrible. Yeah. yeah. I'm really hoping that that starts to change because... There are more people who want to explore this. Absolutely. And they, they can't find people to advise them on how to do it. A lot of your professional firms, even down to plumbers, you know, they say, well, the code doesn't That's let right. me, so I don't even stay current with it. I don't read the magazines about it. I don't right. get the CE about how to do these kinds of things. That's right. Well, I mean, it's, it goes farther, too. There's homeowners associations all over the country that wouldn't allow you to put a Xeriscape garden in your front yard or a vegetable garden because you have to have a lawn, right? Like there's rules like that that are driving water consumption and invasive species and all kinds of things that we're trying to overcome. It's a very big issue and it's not a very sexy activity. People don't love to do it, but it really does make a difference. And it's an area where like architects should be more engaged. We should, those voices should be at that table, not just having career civil servants making those decisions. Um, We should be there to have that conversation. Now, you have recently been honored with an honorary AIA from the AIA, (laughs) and there's going to be an award ceremony here soon. Now, I'm just wondering, have you heard, like, what what do you get from this? I, 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 I've heard rumor that we get a toaster or something. What happens? So, so George, congratulations to you, since you and I were both honored as part of the same group. I'm pretty sure that, you know, the wave from the stage at the keynote. Yeah. And maybe a little pin. A pin. Is, is the, oh, I, I, I think that's about it. Do we get the magazine? Do we get to uh, vote in anything? I don't think we get to vote, and I don't think we get the magazine. I think we might have gotten free registration this year to conference. Okay. Well, that's good. That's, that's good. That is good, because yeah. it was very expensive this year. <laughs> and, and, and is it like an airline where I can buy in, like, and get additional benefits of it, pay an extra $10? I don't think so. But Did I don't know. We could propose that. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of code changes, <laughs> no, I think it's mostly just the glory. I want the toaster. <laughs> The podcast is Design the Future, which you can hear on all your major podcast platforms. Thanks so much, Kira, for talking with me. Thank you. That was George talking with Kira Gould in Chicago at the AIA National Conference. Michael Sinatra is a jazz singer and musician based in Las Vegas. He performs standards from the Great American Songbook, Rat Pack favorites, Christmas classics, and more. His most recent album, Standards 2, is now available alongside his two Christmas albums and the original Standards, which we assume is Standards 1. He also has recorded several singles and EPs, including Blue Moon, Fly Me to the Moon, and I've Got You Under My Skin. He's living the dream of keeping these timeless songs alive. Welcome, Michael. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. So, Michael, where did you grow up? How did you get into this? So my parents, they were both musicians and they were in like a community orchestra. And my mom was a cellist. My dad was a percussionist. And so that's how they met. My uncle and aunt were also in there as well. 
and everybody was a musician. And where was this? Uh, this was in, I think it was in Orange County, because I grew up in San Diego County in California. Okay. So you're a different strain of Sinatra's than Frank and Nancy. Yeah, my grandfather um, grew up in Detroit. My dad was born in Detroit, and then he came out here when he was a kid out in Southern California. My great-grandparents, Vito Sinatra and Antoinette Coppola, they immigrated from um, Palermo, Sicily. So I guess I'm like third, maybe third generation. Third generation, okay. But at some point, you and the California Sinatras, you discovered Sinatra's music, and you've been focusing that a lot, and you do a great job. I appreciate that. So I was a musician as well. So me and my, it was just me and my brother, and my parents, they put us in all kinds of stuff. And we grew up in the middle school, high school bands, community orchestras as well. I was a professional percussionist before I was a singer. So I was a symphonic percussionist as well as musical theater. I did jazz drumming, marching drumming. I did it all before I started. I think it was in the, the late 1990s, I started singing and entertaining. Now, do you ever sing while you're on the drum kit? I did at first, but I haven't... I haven't touched it in so long. Now I, I just hire musicians who are way better than I was, I was ever. So. so I just have more to talk about with them. Like, oh, I like your kit. Oh, what kind of what kind of symbols do you use? Okay. So, yeah. So you have drummer credibility with them. Yeah. Drum cred. I do. I'm not just a singer. I'm all, I was also a musician. So I yeah. do have some cred. <laughs> this song was written by Isham Jones and Gus Kahn and is almost 100 years old. It went right to number one in 1924 and is one of those rare songs that allows the singer and the audience, to easily reimagine the meaning and the backstory. So consequently, it's a huge movie star as a tune, appearing in Casablanca, Incendiary Blonde, A League of Their Own, and the movie we all know and love and associate it with, When Harry Met Sally. Tina Louise sang it on Gilligan's Island, Diane Keaton in Annie Hall, and even Hmm. Danny DeVito with Andrea Marcovici on Taxi. Here's Michael with It Had to Be You. Just to be sad Thinking of you Some others I've seen Might never be mean Might never be cross Or try to be boss But they wouldn't do For nobody else gave me a thrill With all your faults, I love you still It had to be you, wonderful you It had to be you I've seen 
might never be mean Might never be cross Or try to be boss But they wouldn't do For nobody else Gave me a thrill With all your faults I love you still It had to be you Wonderful you It had to be you It had to be you Just wonderful you It had to be you That's nice. Thank you, Michael. It had to be you. I oh, know that was great because that was done in the studio live with, with oh. the, now her name was a Connie. She was amazing. We got to do that live together. Oh, cool. And you don't, you don't see that much anymore, but no, that was, no. and that was my second recording of that. Originally I did it with a live trio where it was pretty much, it was kind of like a live album, but this one was more intimate piano vocals. And I really liked that one. Yeah. Now, you're based in Las Vegas, Michael. How's that city doing still for supporting jazz and the standards that you're so good at? So I just moved out here a little over a year, and things were still closed a little bit. But finally, things are moving. Things are opening. There's so much entertainment going on out here. New venues are popping up. The music scene is really getting out there. So I'm excited. I'm still working on some other opportunities out here. See where that goes. Do you get a lot of work from the casinos? Mostly, I keep busy doing corporate and private events, so I'm, I travel. Okay. Not as much as before COVID, but I'm still traveling around the surrounding states, Arizona, California, Nevada, Utah. And how big a band do you take with you? It's all depending on what the client wants. I just put together whatever band fits their entertainment budget. Ideally, I like a jazz trio or quartet. That's my ideal because that gives more freedom with the musicians as well. We can stretch the songs out. And that's more open then. But but when you're with a big band, now I, I haven't been with a big band since COVID. And I used to go out to Chicago and St. Louis and be with the big 17, 18th big bands. And that was really fun too. But that's more constructed. They're just different. So, I mean, it's the sound of a big band is way different than with a quartet. But I enjoy both. You know, I could see you doing well on one of those shows like America's Got Talent. Because they don't really have a lot of people focusing on the segment of music that you're good at. They just did that here. They were here oh, in really? Vegas. Yeah, they were oh. just out doing their show. I didn't. I didn't check it out, but they were just doing it. I got some other projects. You know, I got kids too, so they're taking up a lot of my time this summer. Kids will do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you guys remember when back at Nordstrom's back in the day, they used to have pianists. Like, yes, oh, they huh? would have a live sure. pianist. So I was walking through and. This lady was playing Fly Me to the Moon, right? And I was like, hey, I recognize that. I can sing that. And she's all, really? Come over here. <laughs> and so what key do you want? And I, I didn't know, well, you know what the key was. And so I just started singing. She's all, okay, this is your key right here. And so I was just singing with her. Anyway, we, we vibed so good. We had a good connection that she ended up hiring me for all her country club and other gigs and slash chauffeur because she was an older lady. Yeah. And we ended up doing gigs together. So that's kind of another reason why I got into singing. And how singing old were well. you when this happened at Nordstrom's? Oh my gosh! So this was okay. I'm 48 now, mm -hmm. and this was this was in the late 90s as well. So yeah, 90s. so 20s. mid 20s. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm not good with the math. <laughs> okay. Well, I think I think we got it. Yeah. I also did back in that same time frame. I used to do dinner theater, interactive, kind of like a Italian comedy wedding. Tony and I, Tina's I wedding, right? Like that? No, it wasn't Tony Tina's. It was Joy and Maria's. It was a different one. Okay. okay. It's also nationwide as well. It used to be back in the day. I got a lot of chops from there, interacting with the audience, working tables, you know, just being a character. Got to interact live and, and do a lot of ad libs. So I got a lot of my chops from there as well. Well, the year was 1958. There was a movie, Black Orpheus. It was about Rio de Janeiro, Brazil's annual festival Carnival, plus the wild popularity of all new jet travel. And so as a consequence, Americans fell in love with the romance of Brazil. 
In a few years, the Brazilian jazz scene, dances such as the samba and the bossa nova, and musicians like Astrid Guberto, Stan Getz, Vaden Powell, and our favorite group named the Milton Banana Milton Trio. Milton Banana, oh yeah. They seized the U.S. Wow. charts. Then a little song we've heard all of our lives came out in 1962. It was called The Girl from Ipanema, which, if you don't know, is a famous beach down in Rio. What we found out with past podcast guest Elian Elias is that the girl from Ipanema is not some abstract character brought to life by the song's writer, Antonio Carlos Yobim. She's real. Her name is Hello Pinheiro, and she's in her late 70s now. Antonio saw her on that beach in 1962, and the rest is music history. The song is so famous that Brazil used it in the 2016 Olympic ceremonies opening, with Gazella Bunchen strutting across the stadium, accompanied to music by the composer's son, Daniel Yobim. Here's Michael from his latest album, Standards 2, with the girl from Ipanema. The girl from Ipanema goes walking in When she passes each one She passes goes up. When she moves She's like a samba that Swings so cool and sways so gentle That when she passes each one She passes goes Just so sadly How can I tell her I love her Yes, I would give my heart gladly But each day when she goes to the sea She looks straight ahead, not at me The girl from Ipanema goes walking in When she passes I smile But she doesn't see Goes walking in When she passes I smile 
But she doesn't see Oh, she doesn't see She doesn't see me Ah That must have been so much fun to record Yeah, that, that was really I love this version So I've covered this before But this time I wanted to redo it And just change up the, you know, the instrumentation We got vibraphone which, you know, I love. Oh, those are cool. So. Yeah. And then the saxophonist is, I've used him a lot. He's actually, he's in Spain. So he's so good that I've been using him for several years now. And I wanted to go more towards, you know, kind of Stan Getz vibe. Mm-hmm. I love Jermaine, but I, you know, I like saxophone. I love the sax. We're using actual Brazilian percussive instruments in there. I don't remember the name of them, but the producer, <laughs> he found a guy. Yeah, drum you here and there. That's all authentic percussion. It sounds it. Yeah, producers are good at finding a guy with the right equipment. Right. Yeah, I know a guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Michael, your website is michaelsinatra.com. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Diane Bald and the Budman family restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs. And by... Modernist Realtor, Angela Roll. Okay, Tom, take us out. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 15,000 significant modernist houses, and access 4 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song is performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. You can see a photo of guest researcher Kelly Policelli, as well as all our staff on the website, usmodernist.org. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive Incorporated, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. That's it for shows from Chicago. Next year, the AIA conference is in San Francisco. I'm Tom Guile. George and I will be back next week with a special edition of U.S. Modernist Radio, our Christmas show, with one of our best musical guests ever. Here's a hint. The Beatles used to open for her. Happy holidays. Somebody take away the sleigh bells.